Today we're having a look at this powerful series where we're talking about what seed is and how it produces a harvest. Everything you could possibly dream of is already inside you. It's already there. We're not waiting for these things to come to our lives. They're already in our lives. So how do I produce it? Through the power of seed. Hello again, my dear friend, and welcome back to Wisdom for Life. My name is Alan Bagg. Today we're having a look at this powerful series where we're talking about what seed is and how it produces a harvest. Remember we had a look yesterday at Mark chapter 4, verse 26, where Jesus said the whole kingdom works this way. It works on the seed principle because He said in verse 14, the sower sows the word. And God is the ultimate sower. He said right at the beginning, light be. Remember, He is the Word. John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. God is Word. Get a hold of that. That's literally who He is. And in other words, when we talk about words in the natural, we think of like our English language or whatever language you may be thinking of uh, and, and the meaning of those words and we use it for communication. He is the Word. So when He speaks, Word goes out, and that Word creates and produces in the natural what He already sees in the realm of the Spirit. So your full provision is already provided for. We saw that yesterday when we went through Mark chapter 4, 26, all the way down, that it's the earth that heals the crops. And so your earth, the soil around your house, already has within it all the vegetables and fruit you can imagine. It's already there, but you bring a specific fruit out of the ground by sowing that seed. The seed itself is not the fruit, but it activates the soil to produce that fruit. And so the same way when you're born again, everything you're ever going to need on this earth, right up till the day you leave this planet, every house you need to live in, every job you need to have, every income you need to receive, every healing you need in your body, every relationship, aspect, everything, everything, everything you could possibly dream of is already inside you. It's already there. We're not waiting for these things to come to our lives. They're already in our lives. So how do I produce it? Through the power of seed. And if we can get that principle true, if we can get, it, it is true, if we can get it in our minds and where we believe that truth and we say, Lord, I get that then I can begin to produce. So I have a specific harvest in mind. I take that specific seed and I sow it. And that way I can produce that harvest in my life. And this is what we were looking at yesterday. We started reading this yesterday where uh, Jesus was talking to this rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. And let's read it again so we're all up to speed. He says, Now as Jesus was going out on the road, verse 17, this rich young ruler came running and knelt before Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one's good one, but one that is God. Now you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. So it's interesting that Jesus doesn't even mention all the Ten Commandments, never mind all the other aspects of the law. He mentions these few. Now, I'm of the opinion that Jesus wanted to set this man up for success. And to do that puts him on a positive road. And so he knows, Jesus already knows what this man's up to, and he knows what he's doing. And so he mentions the things that he knows this guy's meticulously given attention to, and he successfully walked them and so when Jesus mentions them, he says, yeah, I've done that. So now he's in a receptive place. He's positive, he's open, he's ready to receive. And Jesus has to bring this teaching home now. And he says to him in verse 21, 
says he looked at him and loved him and one thing you lack. Now, I want you to get a hold of that on the focus of loved him because he's rich. And somehow the enemies managed to sow into the lives of some believers that it's wrong to be rich. And in fact, use this parable, not even a parable, this is actually something that happened, use this teaching here to say, you see here, Jesus wants people poor because he says, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And it looks like Jesus is saying, give everything away, then you will have treasure in heaven, come take up the cross and follow me. And so there's this underlying thought that unless you're poor, you can't go to heaven. Because if you come down, it says here in verse 23, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. You see there? If you're rich, you can't go to heaven. And that is not what Jesus was saying, because I want you to go back now to verse 21. It says that he loved him. So God loves him while he's wealthy. Okay, get that truth first. Now, looking at him, recognizing this man is wealthy, he does love him, he sees a desire for the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, okay, now if you want to walk in the fullness of the kingdom, there is one thing we need to address. And he says to him, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Now, when Jesus says take up the cross and you go read the other accounts where he says that it was always to men that then landed up being the apostles. He was literally inviting this man on to stop with him. He's saying, if you want to walk with me, here's what you're going to do and then come join me and we'll preach this gospel together. And he says here, verse 22, but he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. As I said yesterday, it wasn't the possession stopping him because I know a lot of wealthy people that have got tremendous wealth and are lovingly and willingly serving Jesus. So the stuff didn't stop him. It was his wrong relationship with the stuff. He was trying to hold on to what he had. So he had obviously worked very hard, put certain principles into practice of the kingdom of God. Now remember that if you're willing and obedient, you inherit the good of the land. So he's not wealthy by accident. He's wealthy because of the blessing of God. Now he's grown attached to these things. And Jesus is trying to set him up for the kingdom lifestyle and gives him a set of instructions and they're too heavy for him and he can't accept it and he walks away. Now I'm going to come back to that and show you how this instruction was set up because if you look at verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Now it sounds like he's saying that it's difficult for a rich man to go to heaven and that's not the wording he used. He said it's hard for those who have riches, I'm going to circle that word have, come back to it, and to enter the kingdom of God. Now we're referring back to what he said in Mark chapter 4 verse 26, the kingdom of God is like as if a man sows seed on the ground. So he's not talking about the place heaven. He's talking about the seed sowing and reaping principle, the kingdom of God. And he says it's difficult for someone who has riches to enter the system. In fact, if you keep reading, he says the disciples are astonished at his words. They're like, whoa, hang on now. What are you saying, Jesus? And Jesus says to him, says to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God, this method of God's system, as we learned in Mark 4, 26, is sowing and reaping. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And verse 26, they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who can be saved? <laughs> you know, whoa. They, 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 they shocked and surprised. Now I have to ask you, why are they surprised? Because if these were all poor people, they would have said to Jesus, yep, there you go. 
amen, high-fiving each other. Yeah, Jesus, tell them, they, they're all trying to be rich. Yeah, look at us, we poor, uh, we got nothing. And, and so, no, they, they are astonished by this saying, and they say, who then can be saved? What are, they, what are they meaning? Now, when you go and study out the rest of Jesus' teachings, you will see it all talks about increase, multiplication. I came that you may have life, have life abundantly. Every time he applied the Word of God in an area of lack, like the food, it multiplied and increased. And so that shows me that there is a process of wealth here where what you take and put into action produces the manifestation of the kingdom of God. And they're watching this. And they're seeing Jesus walking in full provision. They're seeing Him teaching the way of the kingdom of God. And in their minds, according to what they know from the old covenant, even when you tire, the windows of heaven are open and God pours out a blessing. There's not room enough to contain it. If you obey God, you'll eat the good of the land. Uh, uh, all of God's kingdom is about Him looking after you. And so it almost sounds like a contradictory statement. And now they're shocked. They're saying, hang on, Jesus, you're saying if we become rich is what we're hearing you saying. Yeah, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Well, then how's it possible to be saved? And then verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. And so what am I hearing here? He's saying with men it's impossible. See, coming back to this rich young ruler, he was trying to live this lifestyle in his own ability. Everything he owned, he had produced. And now when Jesus was asking him to give it up, he struggled to do that because now it had become about him and his ability to keep it. And Jesus is saying, yeah, as long as you trust what you have raised and try to hang on to it, then it's going to be difficult to enter, in, enter into this kingdom lifestyle of giving, sowing, and reaping. And But when you're with God, all things are possible. In other words, I need to take my eyes off of my natural provision and put them onto God. And isn't that what Jesus was trying to get this man to see? Let's go back to the instruction and have a look at it. What did he say? Verse 21. He said, one thing you lack. Now, we've identified what that is. He wants to serve God. He's doing everything in the natural, and he wants to know what's the next step, but his eyes are still on his stuff. He's grown comfortable in what he has and what he can do. And Jesus says, the one thing you lack, I need to get your eyes off you and onto God. And how does he do that? He has the instruction, sell whatever you have. Now, remember, this man's wealthy. How do you think he got wealthy? He's a businessman, right? He, he's obviously doing things that are causing wealth to happen in his life. And if Jesus is giving him the commandments and he is confident that he's kept them, you can be sure that he has kept the commandment of the tithe. Because that is one of the key instructions in the believer's life. That whatever you receive, honor God with one-tenth of it. So this man was a faithful tither. And so the windows of heaven are open above him. And the blessing has been poured into his life. And it's produced great wealth in his life. So he is a tither. So if he's going to sell what he has... I can guarantee you the moment he sold it, if he sold this thing for 100 rand, he would have put 10 rand in the kingdom of God. And Jesus knew that. So now he's tithing. What's he doing? Opening the windows of heaven. And then he says, give to the poor. Now notice, it doesn't say give everything away. It said, give to the poor. Now, what does the law say? What does the covenant say? The scripture says, give to the poor and the Lord will repay him. The Lord will repay him. What's Jesus setting up here? He's saying, begin the kingdom principle. By you giving away, you are setting yourself up 
for provision. In other words, you don't need to be doing everything you're doing unless God told you to do these things. There are ways that God gives us instruction to develop wealth, but you don't have to trust that. You need to trust the kingdom of God system. And so by beginning the process of giving, you can come on staff with me. You don't have to be working and slaving and laboring anymore. Trust me for your provision because you know as long as the disciples were with Jesus, they didn't lack anything. I mean, remember they were out one day and they're listening to a message and Jesus says to them, feed everybody. And they go, where are we going to get this 120 denarii? It's not even enough to feed these people. And Jesus said, what do you have? Well, five loaves and two fish. But what is that among so many? And Jesus said, give it to me. And he blesses it and it multiplies and feeds everybody there to such an extent that there's 12 baskets left afterwards. What is Jesus doing? He's putting that seed sowing principle. In the moment he broke the bread and gave it into the disciples' hands, it began multiplying. And when they broke and gave it into the hands of the next people, it kept multiplying. And as long as they kept giving to someone else, all that bread multiplied. But it began with that spoken word of Jesus. He blessed it. Now, that's what he's saying here. If you come on staff with me, we need to all be operating in this process. Nothing we have is ours to keep. Everything we have is there to give. And as he started giving, you saw the blessing in Jesus' life. His disciples saw it in their life. And now he's activating it in this young man's life. He's saying, now, if you're going to walk with me, be a tither and be a giver, be a sower. And as you sow, you'll have enough provision. You can come follow me. Let's get to work. And this young man, shocked by this, turned around and said, wow, I can't, I'm, no. He, he says, you want me to give this away? No, I, I need this. I, I've got to keep it. And he walked away and gave up the opportunity of serving Jesus full time. Isn't that amazing? Now, here's what I want us to learn out of this. God is setting us up for harvest but it's going to take us breaking away from what we think. We look at our bank account. We try and hold on to that. That's all I've got. I've got to keep this for tomorrow. But I realize if I sow seed, I begin the harvest principle. And whatever we have, if we hold on to it too much, it'll die in our hands. But when we sow it as a seed, in other words, everything I've got, literally, I hand my life over. That's what the tithe is saying. When I tithe, Father, there you go. 10% is yours. What am I saying? I'm not attached to my finances. I'm honoring you. Everything you've given me, everything I have, you've given me. And that 10% represents my trusting you. I'm sowing it into the kingdom of God. I'm giving it so the word can be preached. Now I know the windows of heaven are open. Now everything else I have is just temporarily mine. I may live in a house, but it's still God's house. The car I'm driving is His. I'm ready. If He says, give it away, I give it away. No problem. Why? Because if He wants me to have a car, there's another one coming. And so all the time, I'm living that constant lifestyle. And that's why when G Peter went on, he says, verse 28, he says to him, See, uh, we have left all and followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who's left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. There it is. The ultimate sowing, the sowing of the word of God, that Jesus, the word of Jesus can be given into the lives of other people who shall not also receive a hundredfold now in this time. There's the harvest. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands with persecutions. Not everyone's going to get it. Not everyone's going to understand it. But he says, and in the age to come, eternal life. Family, I want you to get a hold of this. When you understand this, when we get this truth, when we have revelation that whatever I give into the kingdom of God, is for Jesus' sake and for the Gospels. Every seed you ever sow for the Word of God to be preached, Jesus said, there is a promise of a hundredfold. And that's the harvest where we can continuously live in constant provision. 
And I want to dig into that further tomorrow. We're going to have a look at how to manifest these harvests. How do we see the fullness of this working in all of our lives? And so I've got something else I need to share with you now. And then I'm going to pray for you. There are things that you need prayer for. And I believe for an anointing. Let's pray together right after this. I'll see you then. He is a God of excess. He's a God of abundance. He's a God of overflow. He is a God of increase. He is the Lord of the increase. When He gets involved, man, you cannot stop it. Alan and Janine Bagg invite you to join them for the Increase Anointing Evening taking place on Sunday evening, the 3rd of November. Renew your mind to the fact that your Father is a God of Increase. The company blessed me with a new vehicle as well. God increased me hundredfold. And God has already blessed us with an amazing house. My boss called me into the office and he said, I have transferred your bonus into your banking account. Not only with the microwave, but with two new couches and a tumble dryer. With this promotion, I get car allowance, I get cell phone allowance, lunch allowance, my general salary is increased as well. And the manager tells me, it wasn't actually an interview, it was just, I actually want you to start like yesterday. So join Alan and Janine Bagg on the 3rd of November at 5 p.m. at the Bay Christian Family Church or participate through your seat. But don't miss out on this powerful evening of celebrating the increase anointing. For any information and to get involved, please visit us online. The Word of God reveals that there is a law of faith and this law works by the law of confession. This is a word creation. This is a word kingdom. It is upheld. It is governed by the Word. Jesus, the Son of God, revealed that as His children, when we believe His Word and speak what He said, we will experience those confessions come to pass. So whether I live or die is determined by how I speak. In the series, Alan Bagg will help you discover the importance of confessions, the different types of confessions. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You learn the power of the spoken word and how to apply the law of confession successfully. God has established the system for His children and He built into it the law of confession. And if you understand the law, it works every single time. One of the most powerful principles or laws that God has made available to us is the principle of seed. When a seed is sown, it always grows. If the environment is right, it will grow. God designed us to do that. And the whole kingdom is based on that seed principle. In this series, Alan Bagg will teach you how to apply this powerful principle accurately in your life. God has put into our hands the power to produce in our lives whatever we desire. You will learn how to experience abundant harvests in all areas of your life and you will learn of the fullness of God's blessing as it works in and through you. Get these series together this week and receive them at this great price. Learn how to purposefully and successfully apply the law of confession and discover the power of seed. Visit allenbagministries.org to purchase your series or contact us here at Ministries at any of these details. When you speak the word of God, that is the seed that makes all the other seeds work. And so the law of confession is so vitally important because we can sow something in the natural and yet still speak death over it. Can you imagine a farmer out there planting different wheat seed and all he says is, man, there's always something eating my crops. There's always all, this, all these uh, insects and things and the seed rots and, and I'm not going to get enough rain. And, and if he keeps saying all those negative words, even the seed he's sown is going to fail. No, we need to make sure we have our confession accurate. So that's six powerful parts. And we're going to include with that the power of the seed, a two-part series that's going to show you what are we teaching here. So you got the messages to listen to again and again and again. And that way you're going to develop your faith. You put that together, sowing your seed and then speaking the Word of God accurately, your harvest is coming and you're going to see full provision. So get yours today. I want to pray for you right now because I know many of you have your seed in the ground and we're going to agree together on the great harvest. And so, Father, I thank you for my dear friend and what they are believing for, you already know. They've confessed it, they've said it, and they've sown their seed. 
And I pray that whatever the enemy's done to try and steal that harvest, I bind that in the name of Jesus. I command the devourer to leave that home in Jesus' name. And fathers, your children, your sons and daughters are faithful in their tithe to you. The windows of heaven are open above them. And I speak by the unction in the anointing of God that that anointing manifests in their lives that you'd rebuke the devourer for their sake and that their harvest comes now. Every seed they sow is blessed. And I speak that. I declare it prophetically into every life there. In Jesus' name, I see that promotion coming forth in the name of Jesus. I see that salary being increased in the name of Jesus. Someone's believing you for a house, Father. Bring it to them in Jesus' name. I see that marriage healed and made whole. Uh huh. The enemy tried to break it down last night, but he failed. And I speak love and unity into that home in the name of Jesus. Lord, you bring that child back home. Bring that child back home and reunite that family. We thank you for it. That person that's been addicted to drugs, that's broken in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, I release your freedom in that life, in Jesus' name. And Father, whatever needs are in that home today, I call that household blessed. Your household is blessed, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Now, I believe God hears prayers, and I believe when He hears it, He answers. And I know that that prayer is answered. Now, I may have mentioned something specific in your life, and you know it's true, and when it happens, write to me let me know and i know that what i've spoken now a blessed household you're going to experience it because that word has been spoken and we're in agreement now with the anointing of god that's what it means to walk in partnership walk in faithfulness walk in agreement with the word of god bible says we any two agree touching anything it's done for them and we believe that is so amen praise god well that's all we got time for today. I look forward to being with you again tomorrow. This is Alan Bagg reminding you Jesus is Lord. Remember, life is a choice. Choose life. God bless you. This week's Wisdom for Life programs are available in digital format. So purchase yours online at alanbaggministries.org or contact us at any of our details. Choose life.